I think uh, I will speak for many in this room when I say that as teenagers, uh, we did many things that were significantly more dangerous uh, than we thought. Whether it was speeding home in the worst snowstorm of the year to, to make it home for curfew, uh, you know, walking on thin ice, cliff jumping from very high heights, you know, uh, playing with lighter fluid, you know, trying various types of flips. The list just goes on and on uh, of things that we may have done. And I think the common theme uh, for many of us is that uh, although we perceived a certain danger in these things, uh, we did not fully perceive the danger. And many times, uh, if I'm honest, I probably took my life into my hands. And had someone older or wiser come to us at that moment and corrected us, would we have listened? I don't know. Uh, well, today, uh, older and wiser, the prophet Amos comes to us to help us understand that we might be headed somewhere dangerous. But we're going to look at a, a big chunk of scripture today. Amos 3 verse 1 to 517. Uh, while you go to Amos 3, let, let me remind you of the context of Amos. Uh, Amos is a prophet in the 8th century BC, uh, which was kind of the glory days of Israel, the northern kingdom. There was already two kingdoms at this point. The, the united kingdom under David had split apart, and Israel, uh, Amos prophesied, prophesied during the reign of Jeroboam which was economically prosperous, but re religiously there was deep spiritual rot that needed to be addressed. Uh, our passage today, uh, we're going to kind of go back to this statement, so just hear it out, can be summarized by, th by this statement. The exalted creator has revealed that according to his covenant promise, he will discipline his idolatrous people condemn the wicked, and preserve a remnant who turn to him. I know that's a mouthful. It's a long passage. Um, I'll read it again. The exalted creator who has revealed that, according to his promise, he will discipline his idolatrous people, condemn the wicked, and preserve a remnant who turn to him. I'm going to read Amos 3, verse 1 to 517. Uh, I you're welcome to stand with me as we read God's word, but I understand that some of you may not want to stand because it's a long passage. So if you want to stand with me, that's great. If you don't, uh, that, that's okay too. Amos 3 verse 1. Listen to this message that is that the Lord has spoken to you, Israelites, against the entire clan that I brought from the land of Egypt. I have known only you out of the clans of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Can two walk together without agreeing to meet? Does a lion roar in a forest when it has no prey? Does a lion growl from its lair unless it's captured something? Does a bird land on a trap, uh, in a trap on the ground if there's no bait for it? Does a trap spring from the ground when it's caught nothing? If a ram's horn is blown in a city, aren't people afraid? If a disaster occurs in a city, hasn't the Lord done it? Indeed, the Lord does nothing without revealing his counsel to his servants, the prophets. A lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who will not prophesy? Proclaim on the citadels of A in Ashdod and on the citadels in the land of Egypt. Assemble on the mountains of Samaria and see the great turmoil in the city and the acts of oppression within it. The people are incapable of doing right. This is the Lord's declaration. Those who store up violence and destruction in their citadels. Therefore, the Lord says, an enemy will surround the land. He will destroy your strongholds and plunder your citadels. The Lord says, as a shepherd snatches two legs or a piece of an ear from the lion's mouth, so the Israelites who live in Samaria will be rescued with only the corner of a bed or the cushion of a couch. Listen and testify against the house of Jacob. This is the declaration of the Lord, the God of armies. I will punish the altars of Bethel on the day I punish Israel for its crimes. The horns of the altar will be cut off and fall to the ground. I will demolish the winter house and the summer house. The houses inlaid with ivory will be destroyed and the great houses will come to an end. This is the Lord's declaration. 
Listen to this message, you cows of Bashan, who are on the hill of Samaria, women who oppress the poor and crush the needy, who say to their husbands, bring us something to drink. The Lord has sworn by his holiness, look, the days are coming when you will be taken away with hooks, every last one of you with fish hooks. You will go through breaches in the wall, each woman straight ahead, and you will be driven along toward Harmon. This is the Lord's declaration. Come to Bethel and rebel. Rebel even more at Gilgal. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tents every three days. Offer leavened bread as a thank offering and loudly proclaim your free will offerings. For that is what you Israelites love to do. This is the declaration of the Lord God. I gave you absolutely nothing to eat in all your cities, a shortage of food in all your communities, yet you did not return to me. This is the Lord's declaration. I also withheld the rain from you while you were still three months until harvest. I sent rain on one city, but no rain on another. One field received rain while a field with no rain withered. Two or three cities staggered to another city to drink water, but were not satisfied, yet you did not return to me. This is the Lord's declaration. I struck you with blight and mildew. The locusts devoured your many gardens and vineyards, your fig trees and olive trees, Yet you did not return to me. This is the Lord's declaration. I sent plagues like those of Egypt. I killed your young men with a sword along with your captured horses. I caused the stench of your camp to fill your nostrils. Yet you did not return to me. This is the Lord's declaration. I overthrew some, uh, some of you as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you were like a burning stick snatched from the fire. Yet you did not return to me. This is the Lord's declaration. Therefore, Israel, that is what I will do to you. And since I will do that, Israel, prepare to meet your God. Here he is, the one who forms the mountains, creates the winds, and reveals his thoughts to man. The one who makes the dawn out of darkness and strides on the heights of the earth. The Lord, the God of armies, is his name. Listen to this message that I am singing for you, a lament, house, uh, a lament, house of Israel. She has fallen. Virgin Israel will never rise again. She lies abandoned on her land with no one to raise her up. For the Lord God says, the city that marches out a thousand strong will only have a hundred left. And the one that marches out a hundred strong will only have ten left in the house of Israel. For the Lord says to the house of Israel, seek me and live. Do not seek Bethel or go to Gilgal or journey to Beersheba, or for Gilgal will certainly go into exile and Bethel will, Bethel will come to nothing. Seek the Lord and live, or he will spread like a fire through the house of Joseph. It will consume everything with no one at Bethel to extinguish it. Those who turn justice into wormwood and throw righteousness to the ground, the one uh, uh, who made the Pleiades and the Orion, who turns darkness into dawn and darkens day into night, who summons the water of the sea and pours it out over the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name. He brings destruction on the strong and it falls on the fortress. They hate the one who convicts the guilty at the city gate and despise the one who speaks with integrity. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and exact a grain tax from him, you will never live in the houses of cut stone you have built. You will never drink the wine from the lush vineyards you have planted. For I know your crimes are many and your sins are innumerable. They oppress the righteous, take a bribe and deprive the poor of justice at the city gates. Those who have insight will keep silent at such a time, for the days are evil. Pursue good and not evil so that you may live and the Lord, the God of armies, will be with you as you have claimed. Hate evil and love good. Establish justice in the city gate. Perhaps the Lord, the God of armies, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Therefore, the Lord, the God of armies, the Lord says, there will be wailing in all the public squares. They will cry out in anguish in all the streets. The farmer will be called to, on to mourn and the professional mourner, mourners to wail. There will be wailing in the vineyards for I will pass among them. Uh, pass among you, the Lord has spoken. Please be seated. Uh, you, 
you can see that that was a big passage. Uh, and, and because of the length of the passage, we're just going to treat uh, uh, some themes from this passage. We're not going to walk through verse by verse. We, we just, we'd be here till next Sunday. And so the first theme, to return to that statement uh, I gave you earlier, is the exalted creator. In chapter 4, verse 13, it says these words, The one who forms the mountains, creates the wind, reveals his thoughts to man, the one who makes the dawn out of darkness and strides on the heights of the earth. Or, or 5, verse 8 and 9, The one who made the Pleiades and the Orient, who turns darkness into dawn and darkens the day into night, who summons the water of the sea and pours it out over the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name. But when my friends, or, or myself perhaps, did these foolish things, it, because, it was because we failed to see the gravity of what we were dealing with. So Israel... And looking around at the world and, and the gods of the nations had forgotten the God who made it all and continues to exist as God. The sun rises and sets because he wills it to happen. You know, if we just look outside, all we see is, is made by him and, and belongs to him. If you look at your neighbor, he has made them and they belong to him. If we draw a breath, that breath belongs to him. The wind, the mountains, the constellations, they are but the edges of his strength and glory. And, and it says he strides on the heights of the earth. The Lord Almighty, the sovereign, dominates the earth. We need to remember what God is really like. He is not a doting and inco incompetent grandfather. You see, when, when our God is small, we can be tempted like Israel to make our worship small. When our God is small, our, our delight in him will be small. When our God is small, our obedience to him will be small. And when our God is small, as in the case of Israel, we will think our sins are small. Some have said that by simply looking at the natural world when we are tempted, we can fight temptation because it reminds us of the staggering greatness of God. God is the exalted creator. Second point, our, our creator has revealed. For, for, in Amos 4.13, it says this. He reveals his thoughts to man. The exalted creator, although in principle, having no need of anyone or anything, communicates to us. And this is what the, the beginning of the passage we looked at today is about. I don't know if you remember, there's kind of a whole sequence of cause and effect things. For example, in four, a, uh, the first half, uh, half of verse 4, it says, does a lion roar in the forest when it has no prey? So it's like, d does an effect happen without a cause? No. The effect always has a cause. A and the sequence kind of comes to a climax in verses 6 and 8. If a ram's horn is blown in a city, aren't people afraid? If a disaster occurs in a city, Hasn't the Lord done it? That, that's a pretty big statement. But, but we need to be clear, actually, about what that says and it doesn't say. It does not say every large calamity that ever happens is God punishing sin. What it does say is that no calamity is outside the sovereign plan of God. We were to flip over to Isaiah 45, 6, and 7. I'll just read it to you. It says this. I am the Lord. There is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make success and create disaster. I am the Lord who does all these things. And as I said, there's this cause and effect sequence about what's happening in Israel in verse 7, it says, Indeed, the Lord does nothing without revealing his counsel to his servants, the prophets. Verse 8, A lion has roared, who will not fear? 
the Lord has spoken who will not prophesy. What does this mean? Uh, it means that these words aren't to be taken on par with YouTube advertisements or, or even a really kind of scholarly history textbook or, or science textbook. No, these words are the very words of God. Do you and I take these words seriously or, or, or do they bore us? Or, or perhaps even worse, as in the case of Israel, they bother us. God has revealed his counsels in his word. And one of the most fundamental marks of someone being a Christian rather than just someone going to church is that they love and honor what God has said. Point three, our exalted creator has revealed that according to his covenant promise. Uh, when I speak of God's covenant promise, what do, I, what do I mean by that? I mean that God has chosen Israel to uniquely experience his goodness and presence so that they might reflect that to the world. If you look at Amos or, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, it says this. Listen to the message that the Lord has spoken against you, Israelites, against the entire clan that what? That I brought from the land of Egypt. I have known only you out of all the clans of the earth. What's important for us to understand is the word no. Uh, the, the word no doesn't mean something like I, I'm acquainted with you of all the uh, 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 I'm acquainted with you out of all the clans of the earth. No, of course, of course, God knows all the nations of the earth. It means that I attended to you, I provided for you, I guided and delivered you. Deuteronomy 7, 7 and 8 describes it this way. The Lord had his heart set on you, this is Israel, and chose you, not because you were more numerous than all peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples, but because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your fathers, he brought you out of the he brought you out with a strong hand and redeemed you from the place of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Here, God, not because of Israel's merit, but simply because he is a loving God and makes promises to that end, saves Israel. Israel's election and deliverance from Egypt are acts of mercy. And because of that, they're actually more responsible for how they respond to him. It, 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 to kind of create a parallel, it's one thing for a poor man to steal bread from a corrupt politician to feed his children. It is another thing for a rich man to rob his grandmother to feed his drug addiction. The sins of God's people, whether Israel in the Old Testament or the church in the New Testament, are like stealing from our grandmother. God has only ever done us good, and yet our response is often rebellion. As people, we don't actually sin in ignorance, but rather we sin against the cross of Christ. Our gossip is against the cross. Our lust is against the cross. Our consumeristic greed is against the cross. And it's for this reason that Israel's discipline is actually more strict. It says in this verse, Amos 3 verse 2, Therefore I will punish you for all your iniquities. Greater knowledge of God actually means greater responsibility to him. Point four. Our exalted creator has revealed that according to his covenant promise, he will discipline. God's discipline is, is basically all of these chapters. But, but it's probably clearest expression is in chapter 4, verses 6 to 11. Uh, I'm just going to reread that. It says this. I gave you absolutely nothing to eat in all your cities, a shortage of food in all your communities, yet you did not return to me. This is the Lord's declaration. I also withheld the rain from you while there were still three months until harvest. I sent rain on one city, but no rain on another. One field received rain while a, a field had no rain, while a field that had no rain withered. 
Two or three cities staggered to another city to drink water, but were not satisfied, yet you did not return to me. This is the Lord's declaration. I struck you with blight and mildew. The locusts devoured your many gardens and vineyards, your fig trees and olive trees, yet you did not return to me. This is the Lord's declaration. I sent plagues like those of Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword along with your captured horses. I caused the stench of your camp to fill your nostrils, yet you did not return to me. This is the Lord's declaration. I overthrew some of you as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a burning stick snatched from the fire, yet you did not return to me. This is the Lord's declaration. You probably heard it. There, there's some parallels in, in this kind of poem. First, there are several things that we might consider in our world just kind of happenstance. It just kind of happened that way. For example, uh, it's a famine, drought, blight, mildew, locusts. And yet God says very clearly that he had brought all these things on Israel. As we saw before, God is sovereignly working these painful things to get the people of God's attention. Also, despite both destruction and dissatisfaction, God's people did not return to him. You probably heard that line, you, you did not return to me. So when God brings dissatisfaction into our lives, do we turn to him? When Netflix can't numb it, a snack can't stifle it, the, the digital playground can no longer distract us, when shopping loses its spice, when the medical system utterly fails us, do we turn to him? Likewise, when, when your body won't get well, when you never seem to have enough financially, when you are lonely, do, do we turn to God? I, I don't know all the pers purposes of God that, that God was doing in COVID-19, but I think one of them, at least in my life, maybe for a good many of us, was to humble us so that we would turn to him. Furthermore, if you were to flip over to Deuteronomy 28 and 32, we're not going to do that today, uh, and you would read about the consequences of Israel breaking the covenant that God had made with them, you would see the same things that are in this passage. Drought, famine, blight, mildew, foreign armies. And uh, you have these lines in five, uh, chapter 5, verse 3, about going out a 1,000, coming back a 100, going out a 100, coming back 10. These are all straight out of Deuteronomy. So what? God is actually keeping a promise here. God is keeping a promise to discipline his people. If you're a parent or have parents, so that means everybody in the room, uh, you know that sometimes parents although discipline would actually be good and loving, don't do it. Whether it's because of shame, pride, laziness, forgetfulness, or whatever, often we do not discipline rightly, but God never errs in this way. And I'm using the language of discipline intentionally here, actually, rather than judgment, although sometimes the words are used kind of synonymously in the Bible, actually. Uh, and I think when we read this passage, there can kind of a question emerges in the back of our mind, and it's something like this. Does God judge his own people? And I think it depends what we mean by that question. If we are asking, does God exact retributive judgment on his people, or more crudely, do they experience a little bit of hell, his judicial wrath, the answer must be no. If you read Romans, uh, it's a well-known passage. Romans 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And then down to verse 3. What the law could not do since it was weakened by the flesh, this very struggle that Israel is experiencing, God did. He condemned sin 
in the flesh by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering. Instead of wrath, we as believers will experience God's loving, although sometimes severe discipline. John Calvin says these words, we cannot benefit from his discipline unless we understand that while he is angered by our failings, he is favorable to us and bears us true affection. God's discipline is real and it can be very painful, but it is not condemnation. To return to our, our summary statement, the exalted ruler has revealed that according to his covenant promise, he will discipline his idolatrous people. The, the problem with God's people in this context is that they love other things more than God. God speaks against this clearly in Amos 4, verses 4 and 5. There it says, Come to Bethel and, God speaking sarcastically here, come to Bethel and rebel. Rebel even more at Gilgal. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tents every three days. Offer leavened bread as a thank offering and loudly proclaim your free will offerings. For that is what you Israelites love to do. In this passage, God sarcastically invites his people to come to worship. Bethel, uh, is a place where God had appeared to Abraham, uh, but had built had been built by Jeroboam into kind of a parallel temple to the temple in Jerusalem with a golden calf and its own priest system and all these kinds of things. And it was a busy place. It was a happening place. People were going there, and they liked to, but it was not according to God's ways. In verse 5, I don't know if you caught it, it says, offer leavened bread as the thank offering. Well, this was actually the very thing that they weren't supposed to be doing. It was against God's law to do that. But this is what Israel loves to do. The truth is, in our sinful desires, we often love to reorder the worship of God around ourselves. Do I find it pleasurable? Do I sing because I like it or because it, it actually pleases God? Do I serve in a ministry because I think it's fun or it's at least better than the sermon or because I want to please Jesus Christ? The temple was a busy place, but it was filled with an expression of their own sinful hearts. And we are so inclined to, to the same. The real, the real litmus test of biblical worship and service is whether it is about loving God in ways that reflect his word or whether it's about pleasing ourselves. Verses, uh, chapter 3, verses 13 to 15, kind of explore this theme from a different angle. It says, Listen and testify against the house of Jacob. This is the declaration of the Lord God, the God of armies. I will punish the altars of Bethel. On the, day I, on the day I will punish Israel for its crimes, the horns of the altar will be cut off and fall to the ground. I will demolish the winter and summer house. The houses inlaid with ivory will be destroyed. The great houses will come to an end. This is the Lord's declaration. These verses explore how God will bring down this idolatrous system of worship. And, he, and it's interesting how he does this. He actually pairs the destruction of the temple with the destruction of their luxurious homes. Now, it, it, it needs to be said that the Bible is not against wealth. But the Bible is very clearly against greed. The truth is, as a Western civilization... We are among the wealthiest people in history. I'm sure we've all heard this. And many ancient kings did not approach the standard of living that most middle-class people have. And yet, to the peril of our families, uh, to, the to the peril of those who will not die quickly enough, 
and to the peril of those who are not yet born, we often seek to be richer and more comfortable. And people often get in the way of those desires. Woe to us, a people who would value leisure more than life. Amos 5 verse 11 says, you trample on the poor. Uh, poor, not primarily having an economic connotation of wealth, but so much, but more so of powerlessness. In our culture, it is a war not to love money more than people. Until this point in our passage, or kind of as we work through these passages, the basic assumption is that everyone in the audience of, of this letter, that is, is a part of the true people of God. But it's not quite that simple. Paul will say in the New Testament, uh, not is all Israel is Israel. Simply meaning that some of Old Testament Israel, although ethnically Jewish, were actually rebels and enemies of God. Amos 5 Verses 16 and 17 says this, The Lord, the God of armies, the Lord says, There will be wailing in all the public squares. They will cry out in anguish in all the streets. The farmer will be called on to mourn and the professional mourners to wail. They will be wailing in all the vineyards. And listen to this line, For I will pass among you. The Lord has spoken. Obviously, the wailing and mourning of this passage is because of judgment. But, but I want to draw your attention to that line, uh, I will pass among you. What's significant about that phrase is it's actually an echo of Exodus chapter 12, where God moves among Egypt and strikes down many, many people. Not everyone is a part of God's people. Just because someone shows up at church doesn't make them a Christian any more than being in a garage makes you a car. Those who continue in rebellion will, will be judged. So, so how do we avoid judgment? Uh, let, let's finish our statement off here. The exalted creator has revealed that according to his covenant promise, he will discipline his idolatrous people, condemn the wicked, which we just saw there, and preserve a remnant who turn to him. Uh, before we dive into this last point, I think it's helpful to step back and just think about this, this whole section as a whole. Why did God put this in his word? As we look at the shape of it, behind the veil of discipline, we actually see a loving God who is calling sinners home. Chapter 5, verse 4. For the Lord says to the house of Israel, Seek me and live. Do not seek Bethel or go to Gilgal or journey to Beersheba, for Gilgal will certainly go into exile and Bethel will come to nothing. Seek the Lord and live. God is, people, God is calling people to come back, not primarily to a moral code, actually, but to himself. It is an invitation to fellowship. And that's really what, what God's covenant had been about all along, is about God making a people who would know and love him. Uh, we can flip back to Deuteronomy 30, verse 16. It says this, this is Moses. For I am commanding you today, what? What is God commanding? To love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commands, statutes, and ordinances. Why? So that you may live. Amos uh, 5 verse 14 And 15 continues this theme. It says, pursue good and not evil so that you may live and the Lord God of armies will be with you as you have claimed. Hate evil and love good. Establish justice in the city gate. 
Perhaps the Lord God of armies will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. God's character defines his goodness. And so the, the prophet can say both seek God, seek God and seek goodness. And, and I, I read the word remnant there. That, that might not seem like a very exciting word. <laughs> But in the Old Testament, it's filled with positive connotations. It's like if you say birthday party, you're just like, oh, well, that's a good thing. It's just lots of connotations there that are good. And in the Old Testament, when we hear the word remnant, it's like, oh, there are good things happening there. God wants to be among his people. Here the Lord, as it says in verse, uh, verse 15, it says, the Lord, the God of armies, might be gracious and allow a remnant to continue. So he, he's almighty. The problem is not that he can't finish the job and wipe Israel out completely. But God is patient. Paul will echo the, almost these exact same ideas in Romans 11 verse 5. He says this, So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. What does this all mean? You see, uh, the very fact that the people of God exists is nothing but the sheer mercy of God. We, as the people of God, have no claim on existence outside of his continued desire to be gracious to us. How does God not punish a remnant? Whether it's Old Testament or Israel that's a mess or the New Testament people of God, and, and we can also be very messy if we are sinful. Romans 3, 25 and 26 says this, God presented him, Jesus Christ, as an atoning sacrifice in his blood, received through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, demonstrate that he is just. Because in his restraint, God passed over sins previously committed, like the ones we're reading about. God presented him, Jesus, to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be righteous and declare righteous the one who has faith in Jesus. God does not put the punishment of our sins on ourselves. Instead, he puts it on his son. He is just because he has punished sin and justifier because he has borne sin in Christ. He has put the sins of the remnant on his son. And, and the call to God's people in this passage, in, in this whole passage, is really to come home from their idols, to turn when God disciplines them, to seek the Lord and find forgiveness, ultimately in Jesus Christ. So how do we know if we belong to the remnant? Have we turned from the idols of our selfish desires to Jesus Christ? Have we sought the Lord and found grace? I began this morning uh, by speaking about uh, the foolishness of youth, <laughs> which some of us had more of and some of us had less of. Uh, but for the most part, left us without serious injury. But let us not be so foolish with our souls that we fail to know that we live before a creator God who saves us as his own and disciplines us as his covenant people. His word to us this morning is that we, as a remnant saved by grace in Jesus Christ, would turn from our idols, seek the Lord, and find life. The life offered to Israel uh, of this kind of abundance in the promised land, uh, flowing with milk and honey. Well, it was always only really an echo of the Garden of Eden. It was only, always only really a path back to the Garden. And now, 
Jesus has come and he has said things to us like this. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. And he has said, this is eternal life that, you, uh, that they may know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Let us seek the Lord and find life in him. Let's pray together. Lord God, um, we look to you for life. but we, we, we can't look to ourselves, but we have nothing to offer. We have often wandered and wandered deeply. And yet, God, you call us back to yourself, Lord, and we want to look to Christ as the only hope, our only salvation, and find life in his name. We pray in his great name. Amen.